Chapter Twenty of the Ghost Girl by Henry Kitchell Webster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty: The Watchers and the Watched. He moved a little nearer still. "You're really quite safe now," he said. "We're friends. Mister Drew here is a lawyer from New York, and I'm Arthur Jeffrey." already the terror had begun to go out of her eyes at his name i thought i saw a little glint of recognition you're miss meredith aren't you he asked miss claire meredith she nodded dumbly geoffrey moved a little nearer but seeing the way she shuddered he stopped short it isn't fear she said forming the words stiffly and with difficulty it's cold i've been in the river at that i shuddered too but not with cold i was thinking of the other girl they had found in the river yes the other girl it must have been another after all for this girl was alive and real the blue pallor was disappearing from her white face in the river geoffrey repeated you fled into the river to get away from something she nodded and her eyes widened a little we'd had a touch of the river ourselves he said and we haven't a boat but there'll be one presently but why are you here she asked here on hog island of all deserted places in the world and at this time on a march morning we were on our way to beach hill said geoffrey we were coming up the river in a motor-boat the gasoline gave out so we landed on the island and started off on foot we were planning to swim the rest of the way you were going to beach hill she asked and now alarm lighted up in her eyes again are you friends of dr crows her voice died on the last words and she uttered them with a whisper no said geoffrey soberly we were going there to try to save you from him but i'm afraid we shouldn't have been in time if you hadn't come to meet us she shivered again no she said simply you wouldn't have been in time but but how did you know that i was in this country at all or even alive and how did you know i had to be saved from him it will take a long time to answer all those questions said geoffrey just now there's something more profitable to do she made a move as if to rise but sank back again with a twinge of pain i'm afraid i can't do much she said geoffrey went off a few paces and came back dragging the branching end of the limb i had crashed through on my way downhill he placed it in front of the rock i want your overcoat to drew he said and when I gave it to him, he threw it over the branch in a way that screened the cave entrance fairly elusively. Then he took off his own coat, a big fur-lined affair, and handed it to the girl. "'Take off some of your wet things,' he said. "'The more the better. Then put on my overcoat. Drew and I are going to build a fire.' the thing to do is to get you warm and comfortable before the cold has time to strike in any further you will find a flask in one of my pockets he added with a little brandy in it most of it has already been drunk by the man you frightened out of his wits in the beech hill house to-night she made some demur about accepting our overcoats but geoffrey's quiet authority didn't allow any real resistance we're only wet part way up he said and we're going to get warm rustling firewood i hope she said you won't have to go very far away to get it 
we'll stay within call all the time said jeffrey firewood wasn't especially easy to find at that time of the year and after last night's rain but we kicked open a couple of rotted stumps and got a quantity of dry punk out of the inside once alight that sort of stuff would burn almost anything we collected our faggots on the crest of a little hill just beyond the cave and we kept some sort of talk going all the while for the girl to hear it wasn't wonderful that she should not want to be left alone after what she had been through that night presently we heard her call i'm ready now have you found anything at all in this soggy place that will burn her voice was entirely unlike the dead colourless monotone she had spoken in before her recovery spoke wonders for her spirit and resiliency Geoffrey has many accomplishments and perfections but i have one in which i excel him i can build a fire perhaps his possession of so many advantages makes it all the more remarkable that he should recognize mine he did anyway and sat down beside claire i have begun calling her that already and watched in silence until my task was completed and a bright well-fed blaze was making us all more comfortable it wasn't until i had finished with the fire that i found leisure to look at her when i did i could have exclaimed aloud over the difference the pallor was gone from her cheeks a faint flush of delicate colour was coming into them and her eyes it didn't seem possible that those could be the same eyes that had stared at us in terror so short a while ago as for her hair her great wonderful masses of hair well it was evident that geoffrey was looking at that too but geoffrey with all his temperament and his intuitions and the rest of his artistic equipment has a disconcerting way of being exceedingly practical when you least expect it you ought to take that down he said and give it a chance to dry while we're here in front of the fire don't braid it or anything just shake it out loose around your shoulders it's dreadfully in the way like that she said when i'm sitting down there isn't room for it and that when she tried to follow his suggestion proved true it reached nearly to her knees when she stood erect now she said when she had spread it out as well as she could now may i ask a question again how did you know that i was at beech hill and that i needed saving barton saw you there last night he thought that what he saw was the ghost of a woman we knew to be dead a woman he thought he had murdered she looked very like you in some ways almost miraculously alike was it irene fournier she asked yes he said irene fournier do you know who she was had you ever seen her i only saw her once she said but i've heard of her i think she added after a little silence i think that she was my half-sister geoffrey's eyes widened at that i don't know very much about it she said my father must have been a painter was he she turned to geoffrey do you know he nodded he fell in love i think with a peasant girl down in normandy geoffrey nodded again i don't mean my mother claire said with a little hesitation i mean her sister i think he meant to marry her but he was called away and when he came back she was dead so then he married my mother but i think irene was his daughter too i'm not sure whether he knew about her when he married my mother or not but i know that afterward he settled some money on her she spoke in a strange guarded sort of way 
almost hostile the time i talked with her it was strange to see her she looked so like me so almost exactly like me but my guardian took me away presently and asked her to come and see him i wasn't there then and she wouldn't tell him anything anything that he wanted to know except for a great deal of money he didn't believe that she was telling the truth so he wouldn't pay her and she went away did you tell her who you were geoffrey asked i didn't know the girl said quietly that's what we were trying to find out we spent years trying suddenly geoffrey caught his breath and his eyes lighted up was your guardian an english doctor named williamson he asked and at that she stared at him half frightened how did you know she whispered how did you know that two winters ago said geoffrey i had a studio over in paris in the same court with dr williamson and his wife and daughter some things that happened there with what you just said helped me to guess i guess you might have helped me to guess then said the girl we were badly in need of help of that sort i wish i might if only i'd had a little more of the courage of my convictions that winter i might have solved some of my own mysteries and yours too but let's go back to the beginning the story was that you had died of smallpox in paris did you have smallpox really he might well ask for her skin had the velvety bloom that rarely lasts after childhood yes she answered or at least so they told me but not in paris my aunt and i had been spending the winter in one of the small towns of the Midi. there was a frightful epidemic of it there and about half the town died of it i got well of smallpox but when i was ready to leave the hospital and they asked me whom they should notify to come and get me i couldn't tell them i asked them what my own name was and they rummaged through a big book and decided my name must be celeste Beru, and a terribly tired doctor said i was suffering from aphasia and ought to be looked after but you must have known you weren't a french girl i exclaimed it's funny she said but i didn't find that out for a long time you see i didn't know the name of anything but surely i cried they didn't turn you out on the world like that there was nothing else they could do if you could have seen that town i stayed on for a while and helped nurse the others partly because i was needed but partly in the hope that whatever friends i had would come and claim me but then i made up my mind that my friends whoever they were had probably been told that i had died died and been buried the way they had to bury people during those horrible days so there was nothing to wait for they gave me a hundred francs and i went away down to nice as it happened that was all i had in the world except one or two good rings that i happened to be wearing when they took me to the pest house oh and one or two other trinkets that a doctor happened to remember were mine one of them said geoffrey thoughtfully was a jade earring an odd jade earring once more she paled a little the look in her face was almost one of fear how can you know that she asked unless you know a great deal more i saw you once with it on he said about this time of day and year on the point royale in paris you came and stood beside me 
and then two gendarmes came and you went away do you remember no she said it wouldn't have been me if i was there alone at that hour it would have been the other not irene i asked puzzled no not irene she turned to geoffrey you could see the earring but how could you know that i had only one it was to me that geoffrey made his answer don't you see drew what it was that put us off the track it never occurred to either of us that a pair of earrings could be split we knew that crow had one we assumed that he had the pair just as i assumed that the girl i had seen on the bridge in paris had been wearing a pair because i saw she was wearing one he turned to claire i knew that unless it was a ghost girl i saw that the report of your death was wrong i thought from crow's having the earring that you had come to america and that he was in communication with you and when they told me that a portrait i had painted of you from a photograph was a picture of the girl who had been found in the ice i believed that you had been murdered and that dr crow was the murderer i believed absolutely that you and irene fournier were the same person i didn't discover my mistake until this morning now said i perhaps you'll tell me how you discovered that from looking at the negative barton brought from beech hill in his pocket why said geoffrey you must remember that i had never seen irene fournier nor a picture of her the photograph i painted the portrait from was of course genuine crow got it from paris just as he said but the portrait emphasized the real difference there was between the two faces to counteract the effect of it crow posed irene in the dress and photographed her and pretended to miss meredith that it was the photograph i had returned she thanked me for sending it to her the morning i talked with her i thought then that it simply meant that crow had a duplicate that he had given to her to keep from worrying the minute i saw that plate i knew it was a picture of a different person from the one i'd painted and i saw too that the thing had been retouched to make it look more like the authentic photograph and then i knew that the ghost barton had seen in the beech hill house that night was no more a ghost than the one i had seen on the bridge in paris and i knew that if miss claire meredith were alone at that house with crow she was in mortal danger that's a long explanation miss meredith but it's the reason why we came in such a hurry and why we were nearly too late i turned to miss meredith too it wasn't very polite of me to insist on having my curiosity satisfied right in the middle of your story but i'd seen geoffrey turn away after one look at that plate and say that someone at beech hill was in danger and that there was life or death in our getting there quickly and i've been puzzling over it ever since i wish though if you aren't too tired that you'd go on and tell us the rest but the way she was looking at geoffrey was an indication that i might have spared my apology lips a little parted eyes that were starry in their deep brightness well what girl wouldn't look like that at a man who was telling such a story it wasn't until i asked her to go on with her own that she looked away it's nothing very exciting she began i don't believe i ever had any real adventure until last night i went to nice as i said and pawned my rings and then i sat down on the promenade and began to think about what i should do a nice-looking woman was sitting at the other end of my bench and i spoke to her in french of course she said in english that she didn't understand and i began quite naturally talking to her in english i told her i wanted to get a position as companion or governess 
or something but that i hadn't any references that got me started telling her the whole story it brightened her a little at first it was so incredible that it seemed as if i must be trying to impose on her but luckily her husband was a doctor and he came along just then and questioned me and they finally decided that i would do for their daughter of course none of us knew then that there was anything queer about me except the fact that i couldn't remember names and by the time we did discover it well they had grown fond of me and sorry for me and wouldn't hear of my living anywhere except with them can you tell us what it was that was queer about you geoffrey asked why i used to have lapses of consciousness and wander off and do heaven knows what outlandish things dr williamson concluded that it was my former self that was doing them the girl before the smallpox you know but as i couldn't remember any of the things she had done when i came to it didn't help much toward finding out who she was the only thing to do was to follow me around and see what i did and take care that i didn't get into any serious trouble they did that those people with a devotion her voice choked up a little at that oh i can't talk about it she said and then went on my lapses kept getting worse and longer and all of us got very much discouraged except the doctor himself he insisted that the worse they got the nearer i was to being a normal person again he said the longer and the stronger they were the more likely it was that my memory would begin coming through and by and by that really began to happen there was a lot of argument in the family as to whether i was english or american mrs williamson and evelyn insisted i was english but the doctor thought i was american i was perfectly sure that some of the places i began remembering intimately couldn't be anywhere but in america why did you live in that particular part of paris geoffrey asked it was just a part of their kindness to me i wanted to and they noticed that when i wandered off in my old self you know i always went there so they took an apartment in that court as a matter of fact geoffrey asked didn't you and your aunt live there before you had the smallpox the girl looked at him in simple astonishment why of course rue boissonard and she gave the number i never put those two facts together until this instant though i knew them both independently for quite a while but the williamsons didn't have the same apartment that my aunt and i had lived in geoffrey laughed no he said i had that one she coloured vividly did i haunt you she asked that's exactly what you did said geoffrey i never saw you there but you left some pretty puzzling traces drew can tell you that story some time he's a great yarn spinner but please go on tell us the rest there isn't much more to tell she said about what happened over there my memory kept coming back stronger and stronger all the time until at last i told them the williamsons i mean that i was perfectly competent to look after myself now and that i meant to go to america and find out who i was one of my discoveries about myself was that i could paint a little and i sold everything i painted at pretty good prices so i wasn't financially dependent on the williamsons although of course i owed them a debt that money couldn't repay at all they hated to have me go especially mrs williamson and evelyn and begged me to let the meredith girl lie quiet in her grave down in the south of france 
but i couldn't fond as i am of them there was a well a call of the blood it seemed that drew me you'd remembered your name by that time said geoffrey but that wasn't the name you went by no she said i stuck to the hospital name for a while celeste Baru, until that got to seeming ridiculous and then as the williamsons wanted me to i took their last name they called me a cousin or something and for my first name i had my own claire it was engraved on the inside of one of my rings then pursued geoffrey it was as miss claire williamson that you came to this country she nodded you came alone he asked of course there wasn't any earthly reason why i shouldn't or at least there didn't seem to be i landed in new york yesterday yesterday it seems years since then what did you do with your luggage geoffrey asked rather suddenly she looked at him in frank amusement you ask the oddest questions she said but i did do something odd with it i didn't bring it through the customs you see we landed just at five o'clock i hadn't sent any word to my aunt that i was coming i couldn't be sure that my handwriting would be the same or that she would remember it and i felt that her first thought on getting a letter from me would be that i was an impostor i thought that if i could just walk in and speak to her that that would be much simpler i had set my heart somehow on doing it that night you hadn't any enmity against her then said geoffrey no she said in frank surprise why should i have i am perfectly sure the hospital authorities told her i was dead for anything i know she may have had the disease herself in geoffrey's mind i am sure as well as in mine was the thought of that pin-pricked photograph and a momentary speculation as to what would have happened if the girl had carried out her plan and walked in upon her aunt as she had intended so as soon as we got ashore she went on i walked straight through the customs barrier with nothing but my purse jumped into a taxi and went to my aunt's town house how could you be sure of finding her there geoffrey asked i knew she was still alive i'd seen occasional references to her in the paris herald and i knew she'd never move or do anything like that so i went straight to the old address that i remembered of course i knew that there was a possibility that she'd be at beech hill when the taxi drove up to the house there was another car standing there a big six-cylinder runabout and while i was paying my driver dr crow opened the door and came out i knew him at once though i hadn't seen him since i was ten or twelve years old and i might not have known him if i had seen him anywhere else but i called him by name without any hesitation he knew me too yes said geoffrey i should think he would i see she said thoughtfully because of irene you mean we both nodded he told me that my aunt was at beech hill and he was just starting for there himself he wanted me to go straight up there with him he said it wouldn't take so very long in that high-powered car of his and he would give me a fine spin it didn't seem such a wild thing to do as he suggested it remember he's my cousin we had known each other as children or when i was a child at least so i said i'd go he asked you didn't he geoffrey interrupted when you'd landed and what you'd done since she nodded naturally and what you'd done with your luggage he asked that too she said 
you didn't stop for any dinner said geoffrey you got out of town as fast as you could but somewhere about nine o'clock you stopped at a little village and left the car and went to a lunch wagon and got something to eat you couldn't have deduced that from anything said the girl after a long look into his face you must have seen that exactly he said do you remember another car that was pulled up on the same cross street we were in it i caught just a glimpse of your face and of crows as you turned the corner but well i'd have staked my word then that you were dead i thought the fancied resemblance of that face to claire meredith's and of the man's to crow was just a trick of fancy if crow had been alone i should have recognized him you see he concluded soberly my vanity of opinion might have cost you your life i can't see yet why it didn't miss meredith wasn't at beech hill was she crow had you all to himself there he'd even got the caretaker out of the way why did he delay why didn't he act quicker what was the man's name who broke in she asked barton he's one of the men who broke in said geoffrey i think that's what saved my life one of the things wouldn't you rather not talk about it now geoffrey urged we're terribly interested but we're not inhuman really don't you want to wait until some other day she shook her head i want to tell it now she said and then perhaps not tell it again ever after we'd bought our sandwiches and started on again dr crow began telling me for the first time about my aunt's mental condition he said she had lucid periods and periods that weren't lucid at all when it was dangerous for her to see people impossible really for anyone to be with her except himself i felt a vague discomfort about my journey then felt that if he'd been playing fair he'd have told me that before we started but it seemed foolish to insist on going back so we went on it wasn't till we got inside the gates that he told me his plan he said he'd take me up to his wing of the house and leave me there to make myself comfortable and freshen up from the journey and perhaps have a cup of coffee or something while he went and saw my aunt then he said if she was all right he'd take me into her if not i could wait until morning and see her then she was more herself in the daytime he said i didn't like that at all but i assented to it i thought of course there'd be servants there possibly some old ones who remembered me and that i could take matters more or less into my own hands he drove me up in the car not to the big door but to one at the side a wing that i didn't remember though i remembered the rest of the house perfectly the moment i saw it he let me in with a latch-key instead of ringing there didn't seem to be any servants anywhere i spoke of that but he laughed in a perfectly natural way and said that everybody went to bed with the chickens out here and i knew that was so there was nothing i could do without making a scene and even that would probably not have done me any good if his intentions were sinister and of course if they were all right it would only make me look foolish he showed me into a little dressing-room where i could freshen up after my long ride and when i came out he had a cup of hot coffee and some sandwiches all ready for me he said he didn't want anything himself but that he'd go and make his regular evening visit to my aunt and that if she was all right he'd come and get me he was gone a long time but at last i heard footsteps in one of the downstairs corridors i thought he was coming back but the next thing i heard i didn't like that was somebody letting himself into the study downstairs with a key 
the grate of that key sounded unpleasant somehow made me feel as if i had been a prisoner i supposed of course it was he down there and i expected every minute that he'd come up but he didn't come and at last i went to the head of the stairs and looked down and then i saw that the room wasn't lighted whoever was down there was working in the dark i don't pretend that i wasn't frightened but after all it only makes your fright worse to keep still and wonder what you're frightened about so i lighted a candle and went down i saw a man down there that i knew wasn't dr crow searching through some papers by the light of an electric torch i was fairly in the room before i saw that because of course the light of my own candle was shining in my eyes if i had seen it a little sooner i shouldn't have gone in but he heard me and turned around and gave one look at me it was the most horribly terrified look i ever saw in a man's face he made a little clicking sound in his throat and then turned and ran he bolted through a door a different door than the one he'd come in by and left unlocked behind him and for quite a while i heard him running this way and that through the passages i thought of calling out for help or something and then quite suddenly i decided not to and i decided too that i wouldn't go back to the room where dr crow had left me i'd go over to the other part of the house the part i knew in the hope of finding somebody somebody else than the doctor so i walked down the corridor the burglar had come in by and hunted around and found myself at last in a part of the house that i recognized i wandered around for a while and then i made up my mind to go straight to my aunt's sitting-room if she were at beech hill at all even if she weren't in a condition to see me herself she'd surely have a maid or nurse or a companion or somebody i could go to i got a little confused in the passages but finally i found my way there the room was empty and somehow it looked as if she weren't using it any more and when i went into her bedroom that was empty too i had got back to the sitting-room when a puff of wind from somewhere blew my candle out i hadn't a match and well i was about at the end of my resources or i thought i was i didn't feel equal anyway to exploring that horrible house any further in the dark for i was beginning to have a horror of it i just sat down on a couch in the corner and waited it was storming then the rain was roaring down furiously so that i couldn't hear anything else till pretty soon i felt another puff of wind like the one that had blown out my candle as if someone had opened a door somewhere and then i saw that a man was standing in the room i hadn't heard him come in but it seemed as if he had come out of the clothes closet i didn't cry out i don't often do that i suppose it was partly fright that held me perfectly still and almost kept me from breathing like a nightmare you know he stood there for a minute perfectly still too as if he didn't know which way to go and then there came a blinding blaze of lightning and i saw who it was it was dr crow he had a revolver in his hand but that wasn't the terrifying thing about him it was the look in his face if ever you could see murder in a man's eyes and in his horrible savage smile it was in his face then as soon as the lightning flashed into the room he began looking around rather slowly and carefully but his eyes hadn't got around me when the lightning went out and everything was black again blacker of course to his eyes and mine than it had been before he stood there waiting for the next flash when it came he would see me 
I wanted to use the darkness to run away in, but I couldn't move. I had to sit there, and then, before another flash could come, we heard a shot out in the grounds somewhere, and the sound of a man running, plunging through the underbrush, and at that he darted across the room and out of the door. I don't know how long I sat there before I could get strength enough to stand up again. When I did, I felt my way out of the room and down the stairs, and finally, following a little breeze that kept blowing in my face, I found a door that had been left unlatched, and that let me out of doors. The rain had almost stopped by then, and I could hear a motor-boat throbbing along out in the river. I hurried down the drive as fast as I could. The one thing I wanted to do was to get away from Beech Hill, to put miles and miles between the dreadful place and me, and then go and ask for shelter somewhere. But long before I got to the park gates, I heard someone coming. I left the driveway and hid among the trees. The sky was getting brighter then, and it was almost moonlight. Anyway, it was light enough for me to see who it was that was coming. It was Dr. Crow again. He was still carrying his revolver in his hand. I waited quite a while among the trees for him to get by, and then I went on to the gates. I found them locked, and I knew I couldn't possibly get over the wall. The only way out was the river. I knew that Dr. Crow would go back to the house and search it, and when he found I wasn't there, he'd lock it up and begin searching the grounds. So I went down to the river and waded in as far as I could, and then, well, I kept on. I am a pretty good swimmer, but I've never swum in heavy clothes before. But really, I didn't care much what happened, whether I ever felt land under my feet or not. I just wanted to get away from that horrible, horrible place. The current carried me along pretty well, and presently I found myself wading out again, here on Hog Island. She had gone pretty white during the last part of the narrative. For myself, I felt guilty that we'd let her tell it, even though she had wanted to. Geoffrey reached over and laid a steadying hand on her shoulder. "'Our adventures are over now,' he said. "'Everything's come out all right. We'll brighten up the fire a bit, and that boat of ours should be coming back before long.' "'But he—he—' he... she whispered and nodded mutely in the direction of beech hill he's still there never mind him said geoffrey we'll attend to him presently we'll brighten up the fire a little and isn't there a drop or two of that brandy left you're very good to me she said unsteadily and then suddenly she reached out and caught one of his hands in both of hers but please don't go away never mind the fire i don't want to be left alone somehow somehow the old fear is all coming back after all said i it only takes one of us to get the firewood i rose somewhat stiffly i'll admit gave them a cheerful nod and tramped off into the thicket she didn't seem to mind my going somehow, though she seemed grateful enough over my offer to replenish the fire. I wasn't sorry to tramp around a little and get some of the stiffness out of my legs, and I went rather farther afield than a search for firewood made necessary. Before I came back, I decided I'd go down to the bank at the lower end of the island and see if Richards and the police boat weren't in sight anywhere. But before that I wanted to look at Beech Hill and the boat landing. I thought it possible that I might catch a glimpse of Crow. I suppose it was the thought of him that made me pick my way rather quietly through the undergrowth and down the slope toward the river's edge. From where I stood I commanded a pretty good stretch of the Beech Hill shoreline, and my eyes were busy with the shadows that still lingered in the thickets above, 
when something i suppose it must have been a sound made me look around just past the end of a little point here on hog island i saw projecting out the stern of a little boat a river skiff i went toward it automatically we wanted a boat and here was one come ashore one that had drifted here likely enough for all that i moved cautiously and my footsteps in the soft sand didn't make a sound i rounded the little point clear of an overgrowing bush and saw that the boat's skulls were still in it not unshipped but the thing that engraved itself on my mind the thing i can see yet and that still brings back a certain horror was the trailing end of the painter tied around the forward thwart i stared at it for a breathless instant then looked up and saw crow crouching there revolver in hand he saw me at the same instant smiled wickedly and raised his revolver there wasn't time even for a shout i ducked my head plunged at him he wasn't more than six feet away got a tight grip around his waist and we went down together then there was a blinding flash and silence End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of the ghost girl by henry kitchell webster this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one how it ended it was a soft warm alluring may morning the spring sky had just the thinnest of gauzy cloud veils drawn across it to keep the impetuous young sun from making love too ardently to the half-grown foliage that sheathed the trees when i issued my ultimatum when it began madeline was alone in the room with me watching me finish my breakfast but jack dropped in to see how i was before starting down town and of course gwendolen came along too and they were in time to hear the finish i never summed it up before a jury more eloquently i'm not ill i said there hasn't been anything the matter with me for a week i'm not going to be treated any longer as if i were marked fragile perishable with great care if you people will just go away and let me dress i'll get up and show you a few things and you needn't think it's a joke either i concluded for they were smiling at each other as if my stern decision were not to be taken seriously it happens said madeline that dr armstrong said last night that if you slept well and if this turned out a fine day we could take you out for a ride well said i partly mollified that's all right as far as it goes but it doesn't go half far enough i want to be told what's happened i have lived on intellectual malted milk long enough oh i know everything's all right of course jeffrey's come up and grinned at me every day and you've been bringing me bunches of sweet peas and things with claire's regards so i know that she's all right too but i want to know what happened after crow hit me on the head i want to know whether he got off i want to know whether barton's still in jail i expect he deserves to be but i hope he isn't all the same i want the whole story without any gaps in it and without being patted on the head and told not to worry about that just now you're getting to be a detective said gwendolen impudently as if i hadn't a claim to be called one already how did you know dr armstrong said that we could tell you all that to-day that took all the wind out of my sails in a hurry did he really i exclaimed well then begin oh it's all settled said jack that's jeffrey's job 
we're all going to the studio at eleven o'clock and he's going to tell his tale you too i exclaimed i didn't think anything could tempt you from the office from church you mean he said this is sunday oh i confess it's a loss but i've made up my mind to it you'll have to hurry though said madeline as if hurry weren't the thing i had been demanding it's after ten o'clock i was a bit wobbly about the knees to be sure and my head had a way of turning giddy the natural result of being flat on my back while the crack in my skull had time to knit together again so i hadn't much energy left to bother them with questions while i was being dressed and helped downstairs and bundled into jack's limousine which had all the glass down in honour of the day but there was a sort of determined look about all my family that convinced me that i shouldn't get any answers yet anyway so i admired the park as we drove through and talked politics with jack just as if the word curiosity had never been printed in my dictionary but once i was safely deposited in jeffrey's morris chair with madeline on the arm of it and my best pipe drawing comfortably the whole story came back over me with a rush perhaps it was the studio itself i hadn't been there since the afternoon when richards and i had watched the face the face we had thought to be irene fournier's appear from under its mask of disguising paint on jeffrey's canvas jeffrey never seemed so slow as when one tried to hurry him but at last he turned to me with a grin and asked me where i wanted him to begin the story where begin i cried begin by telling me how it happened that crow didn't get you and miss clare as well as me i hadn't time to give you any warning and if ever i saw a man hunting human game he was that man i can't explain that reasonably myself said jeffrey it was all clare's doing she kept getting whiter and whiter after you had gone away and at last she said she couldn't stand it she'd got to know what had become of you she said she was sure you couldn't be gone as long as that though you hadn't been gone long really so i got up and handed her my revolver that's just for company i said there's absolutely nothing to fear now from anybody all the same her mood had rather got hold of me and i tacked along northwest the direction you'd started in making as little noise as possible i told myself i was doing that in order to have a better chance of hearing you but that wasn't the reason there is a second little ridge on the island beyond the main one and when i climbed that i got a clear view of the branch of the river and of beech hill on the other side and then i glanced down and saw crow he hadn't got very far from his boat then and i could see you lying there in the mud behind him i thought he'd finished you i imagined he thought so too but well luckily a man's feelings don't have time to operate in a situation like that he doesn't do anything but think crow snapped up his revolver and covered me grinning just as claire had described him but it was the last grin he ever wore he was nearly thirty paces away and i figured he had a pretty good chance to miss at that distance so i turned a little away from him leaned back a little and made a slight signal with my hand as if to somebody else who was coming up along behind me and to the right of me his eye wavered at that almost any man's will and i jumped aside and got cover behind a tree come on richards i yelled down to the left and get his boat i'll get him myself then making all the noise i could i came crashing down the hill a little further it was an old trick of course and yet there was a certain plausibility about it because he didn't know of any way that i could know that richards was up there unless i really had him with me 
he hesitated a second and then made a dash for his boat he pushed off and then backed away a few strokes with the skulls then he hesitated again i think the fact that he wasn't fired on may have convinced him that he had been tricked but the next moment there was a shot from over at the right claire fired at when she heard me call out and that decided it he began pulling straight out toward the river but a couple of minutes later richards and the police boat hove in sight around the end of the island i swear i never thought i should be so glad to see the lieutenant crow waved to him as if nothing was the matter and began pulling deliberately enough toward the beech hill landing just as if he meant to get there first and welcome him ashore but he hadn't gone three boat lengths when i heard another motor and saw jack's limousine come tearing down the drive and pull up in the circle just at the head of the bank i shouted to richards get him get crow don't let him go ashore crow stopped rowing at once and waited for the police boat to come alongside i didn't pay attention to anything more just then because as soon as i saw that jack and gwendolen were safe i was down over you trying to find out whether he'd left anything of you or not his voice made amends for the jocularity of his words indeed i could see that was the only way he could speak of a moment like that there was a little silence then he went on with his story richards gave me the details of what happened next crow unshipped his skulls and stood up in the boat when the police boat came alongside just in the act apparently of climbing aboard the other boat and then it looked as if something had tripped him richards doesn't think he meant to do it i can't be sure richards says it was the painter that very same long painter drew yes i said i know anyhow he threw up his arms in an attempt to gain his balance and went overboard capsizing the skiff as he did so of course they expected him to come up and wasted a minute or two for that to happen but he never did come up until they found him with the grappling hooks his pockets were weighted not with regular weights but with all sorts of heavy things there were two revolvers one of them was barton's automatic and a bag of english sovereigns oh and a lot of documents and notebooks and things that he evidently hadn't time to destroy he was ready to make a good getaway if he got the chance we rigged a blanket for you and took you and claire over to beech hill and well that's about all to that part of the story one more question jeffrey said i why didn't crow kill her as soon as he got her down there to beech hill why did he wait i've an idea said jeffrey that we found the reason down at the boathouse someone had been working down there very recently on a dragnet putting the weights on it he didn't mean to make barton's mistake and he wanted everything ready first and then well there was chloral enough in the coffee he left for her to drink and that she happened not to want to have put her sound asleep if not to have killed her oh it was complete enough it was the net that finished richards he looked as sick as i felt when he saw it and as soon as he could get to a telephone he sent word to turn barton loose how did richards feel about the whole thing i asked rather sore and aggrieved i supposed over having gone after everybody but the real criminal thank the lord for something cheerful to talk about at last said jeffrey and the rest were all shaken with sudden laughter can you find it asked gwendolen you lose nearly everything you know never this said jeffrey proudly and he took from his pocket what proved to be an editorial clipping from one of the more serious evening papers it is often 
the editorial began the unpleasant duty of this newspaper to speak in sharp criticism of the police department and consequently it is doubly refreshing to have an opportunity to offer it unqualified praise as well as our hearty congratulation on the possession of so brilliant and efficient an officer as lieutenant richards the solution of the mystery of the beech hill murder would be a credit to the police department in any of the european capitals in in our own annals it is unique with an absence of bluster and noise with admirable reticence with perseverance and logic and occasional flashes of intuition almost uncanny this officer unravelled the tangled ends of that mystery and brought it to a triumphant solution from the fact that the suicide or the accidental drowning of the criminal at the moment of his capture obviates the necessity of a sensational trial and for this the community is to be congratulated it is only fair to attempt to give lieutenant richards some portion of the reclaim that would have been his if the trial had taken place i wanted richards to come around this morning said jeffrey but he told me he was busy in fact he has told me that every time i have asked him since that editorial appeared but judging from his voice over the phone he isn't sore a bit he pulled out his watch claire ought to be here now he said she she still doesn't feel much like hearing the story told over again but she's awfully anxious to see you there was something new in jeffrey's tone something almost shamefaced about his expression the carefree impudence that one associated with him on most occasions had somehow disappeared and yes by jove he was blushing just then we heard a step in the corridor there she is he cried and sprung to the door and flung it open yes there she was if ever it was possible to see the personification of springtime come walking into a room and turn the cool north light of a studio golden we saw it then she didn't look at jeffrey just held out a momentary left hand to him but well she was blushing a little too she came straight over to me holding out both hands i've wanted to see you before she said but they told me it mightn't be good for you to have another look at me until you were quite well i'm sure it would have been said i have you shown him the portrait yet the new portrait she asked turning to jeffrey he shook his head i thought i'd give him a glimpse of the original first i didn't want him to be disappointed aunt is coming to see it this afternoon she said miss meredith i exclaimed confidently enough is she she's getting better claire said soberly i think in a few months more we'll have her quite recovered but the subject was a little difficult to talk about well i'm glad to see this miss meredith so fully recovered anyway said i you're not going to call me that she said the others madeline and gwendolen and jack all say i'm to be one of the family huh, said geoffrey they're not the only ones who say that as a matter of fact i said it first myself end of chapter twenty one End of The Ghost Girl by Henry Kitchell Webster